Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Yeah. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. <coughs> the frog in my throat and Hugo and I are at an event in London today called the Government ICT 2.0 conference, conference? seminar, yeah. conference. something like that. Yeah. And we have been talking open source and Drupal with a few hundred um, people from local, regional, national government institutions in the UK, and it's been a pretty great day. Yes. We did a presentation together that uh, I was pretty happy about, and we'll have some excerpts of that along the way. This is the Acquia podcast, and the, on the Acquia podcast, I get to talk with people about Drupal, about open source technology, community, and uh, I usually say business. Um, when I say business, I mean sort of every aspect of what your business might be. So we have people in the business of helping citizens today. Hugo, introduce yourself and um, tell us one thing about who you are and what you do. Okay, um, I'm Hugo. I am the Chief Innovation Officer at Matter, and we do a lot of work in uh, the public sector working to create digital services that are actually going to meet the new government standards where they need to be so good that people actually want to use them. And so it's all about digital first. And we use Drupal uh, as one of the technologies we uh, work with to do that. And one thing about me, is that um, I'm not a developer myself, but I have done a lot of drinking with a lot of developers, so I can talk a good game. It's learning by osmosis. That's what I always... Exactly. Yes, yes. And I think coding always does dilute well in alcohol, so... So, so do you have a first Drupal memory? How did you come to Drupal? Yeah, so actually it was uh, with Hanani, uh, who is on the uh, Acquia Professional Services team. We were working with a, um, a large insurer, a company called uh, Liverpool Victoria. And my background has been um, working in startups, um, or rather kind of working in the startup community. So I was involved in something called Launch 48 in the UK, and we'd bring a bunch of entrepreneurs together over the weekend build a web business over 48 hours. We started taking that into kind of corporates and one of the first people we did that with was uh, Liverpool Victoria. So they had a, a problem where um, they were, um, basically they identified that if they went in and um, could create a Q&A system like Yahoo Answers in their call centre, uh, they could really reduce call volumes. Uh, with Hanani, we used Drupal to build that system in 48 hours and that was actually launched in uh, their call centers. Fantastic. Why have you stuck with Drupal then all this time? So I think we're very much focused about putting the customer right at the heart of what you're creating. And so you need a lot of flexibility when you do that. And I think that what we see with Drupal is that there's a lot already done, so you don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's got the extensibility so that you can actually go and refine the bits that you need to refine and that there's a huge community out there who've already solved a lot of the problems. So if a problem's already been solved well, that's not one we need to look at. We need to actually look at solving the problems that haven't been done well. And it means that we get a lot for free. Right, and those are the, those are the hard, interesting, valuable problems to solve as well. Exactly, they're the customer's problems. And you know, a lot of the time, we might just be focusing entirely on content because what we find is that uh, people think technology can solve problems when often actually it's about people being able to communicate with people that's going to solve the problem. So talk about being an open source business. Okay, so you know, we, we call ourselves technology agnostic because we, we think that technology should be an enabler um, for those human-centered aspects of change that you're trying to create. And the reason that we are both technology agnostic and support open source is because it's very hard uh, to make a case against open source, right? Because with any proprietary system, uh, you have a lot, lot less flexibility. With open source, you start to be able to 
um, pool the resources of all of the people in that community. You have the ability to go and do anything you want with that technology and actually have that extensibility. And what we find is that open source solutions are awesome. Um, so we we have a lot of power at our fingertips and I think one of the you know big trends that I see happening is the ability for technology to pretty much fall into the background, right? There's some guys who are really keen on it. A lot of my best friends are massive techies, hence the drinking with them. And they get a buzz out of solving the hard tech problems. What we can then do is take those hard tech problems and tie them together to create the hard human problems. And that is kind of where, where we see the, the power of open source really coming into its own. I think it's also one of the challenges of open source because there's such a tech community behind it. Sometimes um, it's hard for non-techies to kind of enter the realm because um, you know techies are not always designers, I think it's fair to say. And so there are times when it can be um, hard for open source projects to actually even explain themselves to the people who might actually want to use them. Um, so I think that's an interesting kind of thought back to the open source community as to how customer centered is your open source project? Could you be getting more support for your open source project by thinking more about the wider range of people who would actually participate? That's a, an interesting challenge. And I think as technologists, we often don't see the forest for the trees. We're so excited about the latest standard, the latest uh, JS library, whatever it is, that we don't necessarily focus on the benefits that that could provide to the people who actually use the stuff that we built in the end, um, which makes it difficult for a lot of us to sell ourselves well or to sell our projects. So yeah. today in our presentation, we were talking about how Drupal as an open source technology at scale is empowering governments to be successful with this new idea of digital government. And we touched on a bunch of aspects of that. Let's talk a little bit about how the majority of people now essentially are accessing government services through mobile devices and what that means, what are the challenges for governments and for their service providers? So I think that um, what we see when we're kind of designing services, kind of working with government organizations is that there is definitely a drive towards uh, using mobile devices. But again, it's about kind of putting the, the customer right at the heart of it and actually looking at what service is it that we're trying to create. I think the interesting thing with mobile devices though, or rather the need to be able to support mobile is the move away from uh, apps and towards responsive design. Because one of the things kind of often see is, you know, someone in, in marketing or someone who is kind of caught on to the need for mobile kind of an app starts talking about the need for an app. And actually what they mean is we need to be able to support people if they're on a mobile device. And once I start talking to them about the test cost of uh, kind of um, testing um, apps and start talking about the kind of device support that you need when you're testing mobile devices generally, it's trying to get an understanding from them as kind of how key is that to the customer experience for this particular piece of the puzzle. Because if something we've kind of identified through customer research is going to be always done on mobile, you need to really increase that device support um, for that particular service. Where if another service like the planning one I talked about is actually unlikely to be done, you probably don't need to put much effort into supporting all of the all of the browsers for that part of the process. And you need to start being more intelligent about how you use that. I think having a platform that can give you responsive design as standard, kind of as part of what you get, is really critical to reducing the cost that it takes to implement those processes that you need to actually support mobile devices. Right, and Drupal supports that very well. Yeah. And it allows you to have a single uh, use case focused design process that starts with uh, currently the smallest phone screens and choose the four things that, that people want to see with your business, with your department, rather than every single possible thing on the giant screen. You have to start with the essentials, yeah. build out from those. I think one of the really key things there as well is it's a really useful design tool. So that, as much as it is about the end user, actually starting with the crux of what you're trying to do is really important for actually being able to design for the key part of that experience. You know, when you try to design for a big screen, often you kind of end up with putting people in 24 different places at the same time to confuse the hell out of them. And it's really helpful to actually start there and design mobile first. So even if we're creating something that is actually not a mobile first experience, that's where we start. 
um, from a design point of view. So we could still talk about phones, tablets, PCs right now. Where does it go when it's PCs, tablets, phones, watches, fitness bands, my car, and my refrigerator, and the Internet the of Oculus. Things? Google and the Glass. Oculus, right? Yep. The Internet of Things and a plethora of devices of every dis set of display capabilities that we can think of or not right now. Yeah, so I, th I think that's a really interesting um, development. I think it changes how you look at content. Um, a lot of people look at content um, very much in the context of just screens. But I think what you need to start doing is really understanding, again, what when someone's using a watch are they going to be doing versus a screen? And actually, if you have one kind of core place where you can hold a lot of your assets, whether they be kind of content that is suitable for mobiles, whether it's content uh, as a kind of whole series across multiple devices, or if you choose single devices, I think you're going to need to be able to have workflows so that you can have content that's written once, but can be pushed through the appropriate channels. Because, you know, someone is going to project onto the moon, so that's going to be one of the options. And it's trying to work out which bits that you want to try and project onto the moon versus having on the watch. Because the context around those different ways of actually interacting with people is what's important here. You know, the smart devices at the moment, the uh, watches, I had a, a jawbone and a Fitbit we were testing out and comparing uh, both the devices. and what I see at the moment is they were interesting for about two weeks. So I think it's kind of quite early days for those. But what they're going to do is um, start to uh, lead on to, I think, a lot of changes in how people actually interact with that data. And I think, you know, one of the things that will be interesting to see is how people act as an intermediary between the data that is available and the end consumers, because they don't want to see the data themselves. Having kind of a data product, uh, like we uh, looked at earlier about DCAM. Yes. Um, so I hadn't come across that. That was really interesting because I think that those sorts of products are going to become really valuable for being able to harness all of those different sources and push them out into something that really is visualised in a way someone can understand and is relevant to them at that point in time in that context that they have. And, you know, one of my favourite apps on my phone is the Train app. And it's really simple because contextually when I use it, it's about going and finding out if I'm going to catch this train and if I need to run right now. The amount of utility around the context that I use that in is really critical. Use it any other time of day, it would be absolutely pointless. And I think that kind of context issue is really, really important, whatever the mechanism for that is. Context, yes, we, we've talked a lot about that in terms of personalization and th this idea of the, the temporality of, of data is interesting how uh, it's very important to me at about seven in the morning and about 4.45, and I could care less the rest of the time. Yeah, something I think people often kind of design either their, their apps, their websites, their businesses, thinking only about uh, when the customer is with them. And actually, you know, even the biggest business in the world, let's take Apple, the first trillion dollar business, right? Um, how much time am I actually with Apple? Well, more than a lot of other brands, but in the greater scheme of things, probably less than 10% of my working day. The rest of the time I'm interacting with other brands, other people. So understanding kind of that wider context, I think, is something that, you know, certainly in kind of the product development sphere, we're seeing really kind of gaining traction. And I think the other thing that's gaining traction is the importance of testing. I mean, you know, you mentioned the personalization and actually also being able to do A-B tests and kind of try and um, provide that different type of content to different people is critical because... We often see that we can make, like, you know, we did a, a recent uh, project where we were able to get a 33% reduction in phone calls by just using content. You know, the technology was already there. It was changing the content that was able to drive that. And I think more and more organizations are going to realize that you've got a CMS. The power of a CMS is that you can manage the content. That means experimenting with what's going to work content-wise to drive your KPIs. And that's something I don't see a lot of people really focusing enough on. In e-commerce, there's quite a lot, but in a lot of other areas, I think that it's underutilized. Right, and it's actually having the, uh, frankly, the courage to step away from your gut feeling about what you think you know about your customers, looking at the data and making informed decisions and, and iterating on what you have based on that. Yep, exactly. So DCAN, 
I will link to that. That is a Drupal distribution for open data portals. It's very, very interesting, and it's completely integrated into Drupal. It's developed by a company called New Civic. I am also going to hook in the part of our presentation where we were speaking together today and add that into this recording. So, and that covers, um, for example, how you added one email to, or one status notification email, to the yeah. planning application, which resulted in a 33% reduction in support calls for that civic entity, which is fantastic, fantastic example of how <clears throat> we can really make real world improvements with just these this seemingly abstract code. So we talked about a bunch of other really important concepts, especially focusing around government. Um, they're relevant not only for the UK market, but around the world. So check that out in the other bit of this podcast. Um, Hugo, give us your shameless plug. You can check me out at Hugo PW on Twitter, and you can also go to experiencematter.co.uk. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. Good cool. talking to you. I would like to call Hugo Pickford Wardle to the stage to talk a little bit about being out in the trenches, working with government uh, clients um, on these issues. So. Why don't you tell us, and you know, we're very pressed for time. Yeah. You are the Chief Innovation Officer at Matter. Yes. What does Matter do? Uh, so at Matter, we're working with government organizations to um, create new experiences that put the, put the citizen at the heart of that experience, work out what they need, so that we can make savings that are needed across lots of different government departments by actually creating experiences that are going to end up making those savings. So we do Drupal integration um, as part of that, and we um, focus uh, a lot on actually trying to bring in a lot of the elements that Jam has already been talking about, about the transparency in those services, and about the participation of those citizens in uh, being able to also lead that into cost savings, really. So, one tendence, what are government bodies trying to accomplish for and with their citizens today? So, I guess what I'm seeing, and um, I was talking about this earlier, is that there is a current mismatch between the financial landscape and the budgets being cut and the expectations of citizens going up because they're actually being exposed to other service providers in the digital space where they expect a certain level of service. And I think that what you're trying to do is try to match those two things. That's, I think, the crux of the problem. <coughs> so the role of government is changing today. And you have some really helpful, uh, especially in the UK, you have some really helpful things if, if uh, <clears throat> Who's familiar with the GDS and the GDS design principles? Yes, we're living with those every day. So talk about the challenges that government is facing today and how the GDS is actually enabling them to address them. So I, I think that what GDS have been doing has been absolutely fantastic because I think what it's done actually starts with the digital strategy because I think the digital strategy is right. I think that's what it fundamentally boils down to is that if you create experiences that are so good that people want to use them, then they aren't going to call your call centre, so they'll use your cheaper version over here and that's going to be the way of doing those cost savings. And I think that what GDS are doing are doing that participation with the community, so opening up everything so that there's actually you know, a manual to use to be able to explain how to do it. And fundamentally, not reinventing the wheel. I think that's kind of a really big part of why the open source movement I think is really important, not just in government actually, but everywhere, because I'd say the same thing in a commercial context, is that if someone's already done all of this work and you can use it, why start from down here if you can start from the point where you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you can focus on what's going to actually add value both to your organisation and to your customers, because what we were talking about earlier was that a lot of the work that we do ends up being in the content, the actual words on the page. And if we're focused on trying to create technology to do something, that's money that could be used on working out what words should we use that to describe to the user in the best possible way to actually make them do the thing. And then that just seems to be a better place to be spending the, the money than on trying to you know, re-engineer a CMS. I mean, a CMS is about presenting content. So if you've already got one that works and you can work on the content piece, it just seems sensible to, to do that. 
And if you can then use that in other parts of the business to be able to open up data on other pieces, it just seems uh, like a sensible approach, really. So in Drupal, we talk a lot about building on the shoulders of giants, um, never having to write the same thing twice. So that can certainly um, not only save costs and add efficiencies, but it also lets you focus on your core business, your core activity, what's actually important for your operation and for your constituents. <clears throat> so now, Hugo, uh, in the UK, I understand that the Society of IT Managers has determined that roughly 43% of access to government services is already digital. Uh, Accenture just did an interesting survey in the United States of a few thousand people, and uh, the response there was that 70% uh, of respondents would like to use more digital access, more mobile, more tablet, more computer, what have you, to access government services than they are already. And 69% um, of the same survey said they would welcome electronic alerts from the government, and more than half indicated that they would consume digital services via mobile websites and apps. So um, how are you serving this need with uh, open source uh, solutions, especially considering that um, a certain segment of the population nowadays can only access the internet via mobile devices? So I think because we start looking at the customer experience, rather than kind of actually working out the, the technology, we're starting with where the customer is, we find that almost in all experiences, there is a need to actually start with designing for, for mobile first. So all of the design work we do is responsive. <laughs> we actually are focused on making sure that if it's going to work on someone's mobile, one of the things that happens when you design for mobile is you're really restricted. So kind of when you have a nice big screen to play with, you can put lots of different <laughs> things on it and tell them to go in 27 different directions at the same time and confuse the hell out of people. But if you have a mobile screen, you can probably only tell them to do one thing at a time and keep them very focused. So it's both useful from a design point of view, but then actually being able to make sure that people can have a ubiquitous experience wherever they're actually interacting with you, I think is, is really key. And there are only a few places where we haven't done that. So with district surveyors, when we kind of went and did that work, we realized actually everyone who's interacting with this is mobile. It's mobile only. It's, it doesn't really need to be focused on designing for other platforms. Whereas for most of it, it's actually designing for all of those different experiences and making something that's going to work across them all. But also, not using apps a lot of the time, because unless you've got a really compelling reason to create an app, there's a massive cost of ownership associated with it. You know, you first of all, your iPhone, then you've got your iPad, then you've got your Android. Suddenly, you're pretty much bankrupt. And unless there is real value in having an app as opposed to a responsive website, it just doesn't make any sense. So I think it's always about trying to, again, go back to the customer, work out why they're interacting with it, you know, why are they interacting with it via a mobile device? Well, often they're multitasking, and they kind of, you know, whether they're sitting at home watching TV whilst uh, interacting with the government, or whether they're trying to do it on their commute into work. Those are the sorts of questions that you kind of start being able to design the right experience for. And when you've got something where people have already done the work to make plenty of responsive things as well, you can actually test those ideas out and actually get some proof that the investment you're making anyway is going to be worthwhile. So we call this bit of the, we call this segment avoiding the queue. Um, I think the more common term now is channel shift in the UK. Uh, in fact, I'll be speaking at a whole government IT conference that's called channel shift something, something, something government soon. Um, so talk about channel shift. Um, talk about the open source mandate in UK government IT. Um, and then tell us a little bit about this very beautiful, very practical site. This is an actual screenshot from my phone last night of, the, uh, of, of this particular site. So, yep. so channel shift and the open source mandate yep. and... So the work that we did at Westminster was, I mean it was a channel shift project. Right? So the whole saving, the whole business case was around channel shift. Which actually I think comes in two parts. Because I think when you break it down, there is the app shifting those calls from the call center to the digital channels. So if someone has a query, being able to self-serve on that digital channel. But then there's also the really key part of the uh, avoiding the repeat calls that are caused by uh, not having the right information, not having the right experience, not being able to self-serve online. Um, so again, because we can also put the same system into the call centre and actually start having um, a system that is the website and the system that the call centre use and start feeding um, the content 
that is being collected from the call centre back to customers, you can actually make real changes in, um, in the number of calls that you're receiving. We did an experiment actually, just putting an, um, an extra touch point into the planning journey at uh, West Manchester. And through the content and the detail of that uh, particular touch point, we uh, were basically saying, yes, we received your planning application, and don't call us for the next two weeks because we're going through the process to work out what we're going to, to do with it. And here's the time scale. Just by doing that, we reduced calls by 33% because those calls were not only one call, but people called up repeatedly to find out where their application was. And I think that you know, the fact that um, the government have written a strategy where they're putting open source at the heart of it is because that test that we did was uh, not BAU, it was actually go and prove that this piece will work before going into BAU. And I think there's both a you know, really strong case for putting open source at the heart of, of your actual production system, but also it's that participation part that you can go and actually use it to create experiences that you can test with real customers to build that case to put it into the core of your business as well. And so hopefully that answers. That sounds great. Yep. So, Hugo is with Matter. They have a stand upstairs. Um, stand number two. Stand number two. You can find them online <laughs> at... Oh, experiencematter.co.uk. Oh, experience hey, thanks a lot. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.